Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and uh, today we're going to be taking a look at another GPU in my ever-growing GPU collection. This is a 290X uh, VaporX, except this is a pretty Buildzoided up 290X VaporX, as you can probably tell by this, by, by the ink down there. Um, well, by the Sharpie down there, it's just technically ink. But uh, let's take the heatsink off, because right now, you know, you might be looking at this and thinking, it looks pretty stock, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And this is just to protect the die when there's no thermal paste, because uh, I'm paranoid about cracking edges, so, yeah. But, as you can clearly see, it's not quite so stock, is it? Um, so, yeah, um, you know, picked this card up on eBay ages and ages ago, and then neglected cleaning it for ages and ages. Uh, but since then, um, you know, I finally got around to cleaning it, uh, cleaning it, and I basically went on, like, basically did a bunch of benchmarking with the card, uh, ever since I cleaned it up. So at this point, like, the, the main thing that, like, the, and I benched it on water cooling, so I didn't actually bench it on, bench it on the stock cooler, because when I actually finally got around to cleaning the card, um, I didn't have the right size thermal pads, because this card's heatsink is which actually this is one of like my major issues with the VaporX heat sinks is just like because they sync all the VRAM into the same assembly as the actual GPU core if you have a uh, like if your thermal pads are a little bit too thick or something you will not have the thermal like your your core will not have contact to the heat sink which is really really annoying so basically i didn't have the right size of thermal pads and and uh, yeah so i i basically uh, delayed rebuilding the card because th this heatsink assembly is really elaborate and probably I think the most impressive heatsink Sapphire has ever built but I've not yet actually run the card on this heatsink but th there's a lot of cool things that this heatsink does that's just like even on paper it sounds really cool so let's talk a bit about that and also some of the modifications I've done so the first thing that's uh, kind of special about this here PCB is this tab up here actually um, yeah, not not the VRM. We'll get to that, but uh, and I think I have done a well. That's a really old PCB breakdown, and and the information in it is not great. Like that one needs to get reshot. But um, yeah, but th this PCB is pretty special because of this strip right here. Um, so this strip is uh, basically a ground, um, just exposed ground plane, and the idea behind doing this is that you can sink heat through the PCB, because the PCB is a fiberglass copper sandwich, right? Um, so you can sink heat through the copper, like the ground plane of the PCB into this strip up here. And then there's thermal pads, which you can see were like the imprint from the thermal pads that would transfer that heat into the, the heat sink up here on this, in, into this section right here, which, uh, I mean, it doesn't have a ton of surface area, but uh, it does actually, well, I'm not sure that it's soldered into the fin stack, but it makes some contact with the fin stack over here. So yeah, basically like an intern, like a PCB cooling system straight up, uh, which is pretty cool. Of course, the EVGA K uh, Kingpin cards actually tried to do something similar with the exposed ground plane gold trim that they have on them. So that's kind of the same idea, except I think this is a uh, th this is the cheaper way to do it, and I think the execution here is a bit more uh, effective because here, instead of just relying on the strip to do its own heat sinking, you just whack a heat sink on the heat, like on the sort of thermal transfer plane from the PCB. So, yeah, that, that's like the sort of co first co cool little thing about the card. We of course have dual eight pins. Uh, there's a BIOS switch, which uh, we we have it as a button. Um, uh, it does light up when it's pushed in. Ground plane strip also goes, you know, is on the back that gets sunk into the uh, back plate that the card comes with. Um, and that kind of covers the that cooling part. Then the actual heatsink itself, I mean, this is a 290X VaporX. So, of course, we have a vapor chamber, though I can't spot the fill port for this one. It's probably... Yeah, I have no idea where the fill port on this one is, so... But that is a vapor chamber. Or at least it should be a vapor chamber. I don't think Sapphire... And No, I can see it. It's a vapor chamber. So um, I'm not sure. Oh, no, you can just about see it. So you can see like these regular dot... Kind of regular dot pattern sort of in the heatsink. It's really faint. I'm not sure if YouTube's compression will show it. But yeah, okay, you can definitely see it now. So you can kind of see... Yeah, right here you see these dots right there. 
So those are basically, um, well, I'm actually not sure that much on the specifics of vapor chamber internals, but they're basically like pillars inside the vapor chamber. I think that's what they are. And yeah, you can see them. So that tells us that this definitely is a vapor chamber, though I can't actually find the fill port for it. Um, and then that vapor chamber, of course, does the standard vapor X thing of transferring into a bunch of heat pipes, including this really fat 10 millimeter one. So then we have heat pipes, you know, three heat pipes going into this fin stack. And then the other two heat pipes, because there are five of them, um, just kind of loop back and into this main fin stack over here. So yeah, and then we got, you know, three fans up top and a shroud that I think looks really, really nice. Like, I'm not a big fan of the color blue, but this this looks great. Like this is an absolutely gorgeous shroud in, uh, in, in my, uh, in my opinion. So yeah, so that's kind of the heatsink assembly there. Now let's go to the PCB. So VRM, um, this is all V core. So this is our V core VRM over here controlled by a 3567B, um, 10 phase IR, uh, 6811 high side MOSFET, IR 6894 low side MOSFET, of course, driven by a bunch of IR3598s located right over here in a straight line. Those are, of course, also our doublers because the 3598 does doubling and driving. So there's two drivers built into it and you can either drive them independently with separate PWM signals or you can push one PWM signal in and get drive for two uh, phases out of that. We also have a bunch of little LEDs to indicate active phases. This is actually kind of fun to watch <laughs> when, when the card is running because it does go up and down. I've... I, uh, I want to, well, I want to replicate this functionality on some of my other GPUs. Um, and the thing is, these are green. So I am going to be looking into swapping them out with blue or white LEDs, except I'm not sure how the drive circuit on this works right now. So I'm not sure if I can just swap in a higher voltage LED and everything will work. Or if I have to swap in like, cause right now this runs on 1.8 volts for the LEDs, if I remember correctly. So, but that might just be because the LED itself is a 1.8 volt LED. So, you know, that doesn't really say much, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it's driven. So, so if it is just driven with actually like 1.8 volts somehow, then I can't just swap in a blue LED because those need like 2.5 or something. Um, so yeah, I, <laughs> that that's, it's one minor issue that, that, well, I, I just need to figure that out. Um, and then uh, we can have the card with blue LEDs because I do think green uh, is quite awful on a card like this. Um, so yeah, and then the VCore VRM, um, the, the layout here is not what you would opt for for like optimal power delivery because you do, like it's not as bad as I was expecting. Like I was thinking with this much distance in your, in your like from your last phase to your first phases, right? Um, you'd actually have a significant amount of voltage drop across there, but it's only a couple of millivolts. It's like 10, 20 millivolts from this phase to that phase, even at high core voltage. That's not even at stock. That's a really high core voltage. You still get very little, uh, very little power drop across, uh, like a very little voltage drop across this part. And then most of the voltage drop and even going to the actual GPU core, this thing does not drop a lot of voltage, which is really surprising to me. Um, the load line calibration on this thing is actually, oh yeah, actually that that's the, um, okay, no, we'll, we'll stick to the VRM and we'll get to the, the load line stuff later. So yeah, like power to like voltage regulation wise, this actually works. Like it, I'm surprised how well it works because this is more, uh, this layout is really more optimized for VRM thermals. This VRM runs ice cold because you have so much space between all of the phases. And this is one of those, uh, cards from Sapphire, which has these inductors that goes all the way through the PCB. And this is one, and in this case, I will say that these aren't actually a huge downside. So I have a 7970 VaporX 6 gig, and I also have a, uh, 280X, uh, Toxic Edition coming in very soon. And those all use like this type of inductor that, you know, Sapphire has, which goes straight through the PCB. Um, all right, let's get them. All right, yeah. Now you can see it, they go right through the PCB. And the problem is, well, if you put them in a straight line, where does your ground plane go, right? Like that, that is a actually major question is like where, because the thing is your current flow in, a VR, in this VRM, right? The current flow through say this phase right here is gonna be basically out the phase to the core and then back, back down to the center of the VRM here because the low side MOSFET over here connects uh, the phase to ground. So, your current flow is through the inductor to the core, back to the low side MOSFET, through the low side MOSFET, back through the inductor, 
right? And then when the phase is on, then it's uh, 12 volts through the uh, through the MOSFET, through the inductor, to the core, back through the ground plane to the PSU. <laughs> I think that's the correct current path. Yeah, because high side MOSFET on. Yeah, I do have that correct. And then when your high side MOSFET is off, all the current flows through the low side inductor. And so a big problem with this type of inductor is if you put them in a straight line, where you, you can't have a return path because your ground plane has a great big freaking hole in it. Um, so Sapphire has gone to some like interesting style, like PCB layout choices with some of their cards to make these inductors work. And I still have a suspicion that they don't work quite as well as like, they're not ideal, but here that's not a problem. You have a nice, you know, nice uh, connection to ground for the MOSFETs over here through the center. And then power just comes out off the sides. So this works really, really well. Um, like surprisingly well. Stock switching frequency on this is actually 800 kilohertz and 400 kilohertz per phase, and it still runs just like, it runs ice cold. Seriously, like uh, when I was benching this on water cooling, I didn't even bother with the little, like this is mostly an aesthetic thing. And I guess the VRM also really benefits from the fact that like any heat that this VRM dumps into the ground plane gets dissipated by this strip up here, which does actually make this PCB a pain to solder on because it is really good at sinking heat. Um, but uh, they also have this little like uh, uh, aesthetic plate over here. It does it does have some surface area, but it's you know it's not exactly prime heatsink material. It, it's mostly an aesthetics thing. Um, like they've actually covered up a good chunk of the finish, right? <laughs> By the with the sapphire logo thing. But uh, anyway. VRM runs really really cool. Um, at least with on water cooling. I don't know how well it works. I guess. Like, it also, like, obviously, if you're actually running this heatsink, then uh, the air that that VRM is cooled with is air that's went through this fin stack, and that would be significantly higher than ambient air temperature. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that works. Well, I'm not sure I actually care that much. <laughs> but, I, well, the, the cool thing is the card does have great, um, so like, software support for VRM temperatures. So Sapphire Tricks just reads off the V-Core... Uh, Vcore VRM temperature, GPU-Z will actually read off this temperature, uh, Vcore and the VDDCI and memory phase over here, which this is kind of indirectly because uh, the way the power delivery works on these um, uh, R9290Xs is that the 3567B is a 6 plus 2 phase voltage controller um, in its like, yeah, in its maximum configuration, it's a 6 plus 2 phase. So this thing is running 5 phases. So here it's running as a 5 plus 1 because that plus 1, that plus part has to be used for your VDDCI, if I remember correctly. So here it's running as a five plus one because you have five phase V-core with the doublers to get 10 phases. And then you have plus one for your VDDCI all the way over here. And so this chip offers volt uh, temperature monitoring for all of the phases hooked up to it. So you have temperature monitoring for V-core because it controls that. And you have temperature monitoring for this phase over here because that's VDDCI. And the VDDCI sits right next to VMEM so you actually indirectly get temperature monitoring for both. Because if this is really cold, like th this can't be cold if that's hot, right? Like they're literally right next to each other. Um, and I can't actually tell where the temperature sensor is in there. Mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure where the thermistor is, but uh, like they're really close, like physically they're right next to each other, so you can't have too much of a temperature difference between them. Um, and so it, it actually gives temperature monitoring for basically all of the main voltage regulators on the card. Um, so we've already talked about the chokes, the, the fact that this VRM runs really cool. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh yeah, this thing, these three pins. So I've added this connector right... Uh... Oh, will it focus? Well, I added these th this connector right here. And the reason I added that is because recently I picked up one of these. So this is an Infineon USB-005. I've heard from some guy who wants to make like a, a cheaper alternative to these because these aren't exactly cheap. Um, I got mine for like 50 quid or something. But the thing is, is I have like several hundred quid worth of uh, graphics cards with international rectifier voltage controllers. So this seems like a really cool thing to have because this plugs in uh, right here. Oh. Well, it's not powered right now, so it doesn't matter which way I plug it in, but I think that's the wrong way. Yeah, that's the wrong way. It should go this way. So you can plug that in right there and it gives you 
all of the control. Like, you can tweak load line, you can tweak switching frequency, you can change phase shedding, you can tweak the... Like, Infineon has a whole bunch of, like, smart transient response... Uh, well, like, advanced transient response management stuff um, available for you. And so if you know a lot about the VRM you're dealing with, you can actually adjust the transient response uh, management stuff using one of these. Um, I'm not sure how any of that works. <laughs> like, I've literally, this is the first time I've ever used it, um, with this card right here. And I basically just used it to change the switching frequency, and, uh, I messed around a little bit with the phase shedding, but that wasn't really achieving anything. Um, and then I messed around with, uh, the load line, which, uh, also didn't really seem to achieve much. But, uh... Yeah, like, it, it does have, like, it does give you a lot of capabilities. It can also monitor, like, temperature and current. But the thing is, with the 290X, this is super laggy. And I think that might be down to the fact that, like, 290Xs apparently just have a ton of I2C. And, like, well, this is on, uh, yeah, it's I2C or SM bus, But, like, there's a ton of traffic on, on that, uh, on the communication to the IR3567B. So, actually, well, on even anything on the 290X, actually, like flashing a BIOS on one of these absolutely bloody sucks. It takes forever. Um, so, yeah, because of that, like, I think that's why this was super laggy, but uh, it might just be laggy all the time. I'm, I'm not sure. But the utility is not fun to mess with because having it uh, when it auto update, like when it's set to automatically update as a, like run VRM te telemetry, this this is really not fun to mess with, but it is really really powerful because we can just change switching frequency, load line calibration, everything really, like literally everything. So that that is really really awesome, and I'm super excited to use it on like a bunch of my other cards because uh, like I can I can do things like uh, so I have a uh, the VRM that I've chopped off the RX 480 GTR, so I can actually use this to reprogram that chopped off VRM because that thing has a. Like, I, it has a load line that's really kind of annoying, and it has a bunch of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I can reprogram it with this. So, that's that's pretty cool. So, that's why I have the three pins over here. Um, and, yeah, so I messed with, control, uh, with that on this card, which was pretty fun. Um, and then the other thing that I've done with the card is I've just uh, thrown a custom BIOS on it, which uh, all I've really done in that BIOS is I've changed the memory timing, so... This thing is currently set to like 1375 uh, memory strap, um, which it runs great. It runs all the way up to like 1680 something megahertz. It's on SK Hynix memory. I haven't tested the 1250 megahertz strap. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that one will work better. I did try to mess around with the new, uh, there's like a new utility for AMD GPUs that lets you change memory timings on the fly. And I did want to mess with that, but... Um, there was an issue with it where basically, like, I couldn't get the settings to stick properly. So, um, yeah, I need to need to experiment with that some more in the future. Um, but ultimately, for now, I have the like, I have a really high score within Firestrike with this thing, so I'm pretty happy with that. And then I also ran a bunch of Crossfire uh, Firestrike with this 290X and my Matrix 290X, and there I absolutely freaking killed it. Um, I currently have first place for 290X Crossfire fi uh, Firestrike. Um, at, uh, I actually, I'm the first person to do 28,000 points in Fire Strike on two 290Xs. Now, um, uh, that's not really that much of an achievement, because it is still, like, on water cooling. This card was on water cooling, the other 290X was on freaking air cooling. Um, the, the Matrix was on air cooling. So, yeah, like, not a huge achievement, really, because it was, like, it was just air cooling, right? It's just ambient. But uh, still, um, it's like I, I've had fun benching this card alone. I've had it clocked all the way up to twelve hundred and seventy core, which uh, you know there's definitely cards that cards that can go faster than that, um, and that's even after all these modifications. But what's really interesting about this card is that it doesn't crash. Like I can run it all the way up to like twelve eighty five core, um, and I've done that on the same voltage that I bench at twelve seventy. And the thing is, all that really happens is not so much that it crashes, it scores really badly. Like, the score just falls off a cliff if you raise the core voltage too high, which is kind of unique to this card, because most of my other cards, like, the score goes up, 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 and then the card just does not finish the benchmark. Um, and th this card is different in that, you know, you can go up, 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 and then it crashes, <laughs> and then it just keep going up, and the score starts coming down. Um, and so it's actually really hard for me to gauge the impact of the capacitor mods that I've done. Um, 
which uh, one of the big focuses again with these was just to get the the stock heatsink to clear because like the whole point of as far as I'm concerned the whole point of owning a VaporX card is so that you can use the VaporX heatsink if you can't keep the VaporX heatsink on a VaporX card why do you have a VaporX right um, so yeah so I've done the capacitor mods and uh, it's a kind of an interesting mix that I've done. I basically tried to focus all of my uh, mods towards the GPU core, not towards the VRM, because uh, you can actually kind of see how Sapphire's done. Well, they have the like low frequency filtering bulk capacitors all the way over, you know, all the way to the to the last phase, which I think might be partially just an aesthetics thing as well, because um, obviously they're kind of going for like a, a car engine aesthetic with, with this whole VRM, right? But uh, um, they, they did also like put the higher frequency stuff basically towards the core, which makes sense, right? You have really high, uh, really high frequency noise comes from here. And then, uh, noise in the switching frequency of the actual phases themselves is in this area. And that's going to be a couple hundred kilohertz, right? 400 or 500 kilohertz. Cause I did actually clock the VRM up all the way to like one megahertz switching frequency from the controller. So 500 kilohertz per phase. Um, again, using the lovely utility right here well th this lovely dongle right here so yeah this thing's awesome if you have a lot of amd um actually it not even amd like there's a bunch of nvidia cards that are on international rectifier controllers and this should work with those as well so this is potentially like if you have piles of gpus with ir stuff um i'd strongly recommend getting one of, well I, I want to do a whole video about this thing, like, because I have a bunch of cards and I want to test it on, like, CHL8228, CHL8225, um, 3567B, 35217, so the chip on Vega. Um, I want to try a 3595, which I think, is it 95? I think it's a 3595 that's, like, on high-end NVIDIA, CHL8318. Like, I just want to run this thing on bloody everything, because this thing's awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... You know, uh, where was I? Right, capacitor mods. So anyway, um, <laughs> you know, bulk capacitance is lower frequency, so you put it towards the lower frequency uh, VR, or like towards the phases, because th those produce the low frequency noise. The GPU core itself produces high frequency noise, which is why you have all of these multi-layer ceramics right behind it. And uh, in that department, I've actually not added anything right here. Blech. I've not added anything right here because... Uh, well, mounting brackets and that kind of thing are pretty major, like, are just a concern for me right there. And I didn't want to have, like, sky, like, uh, actually, I think it doesn't even clear the backplate. Oh, actually, wait, it does. And yeah, the backplate is actually in pretty awful condition. I might swap this backplate with the other backplate I have, because I have several of them, but... Yeah, it's like if I wanted to stack capacitors right there, then that that's the that's the space I have to squeeze them into. Um, which I kind of just decided, you know what, I'm just not going to bother. Because the other thing is, is if I'm running an LN2 pot, then uh, you can, act, like, what I've been doing recently is I use the Morpheus uh, rear, like, back of card hold down and use that with LN2 pots. And then it's like, if you have capacitors, skyscrapers sticking off the back of the cord, well, you can't run that. Um, so, yeah, and I've just kind of decided, well, capacitor skyscrapers probably have less impact than being able to run the, the GPU with a better uh ln2 pot mount so we're just not gonna run skyscrapers on the back of the core um right but uh that did not stop me from doing this right here because like initially i th thought this was for memory but actually sapphire um this is like these are tantalums and i didn't actually look up their part number so i don't know if they're like high frequency or not they might be um i know panasonic for sure in this package size makes some really like uh high frequency uh tantalums like i actually wanted to buy a bunch of them except they're like two dollars a piece <laughs> they're probably not those but uh they might be from the same series and just like lower capacitance or something because i was looking like like 220 microfarad three milliohm esr and then like optimized for super low equivalent series inductance and they're like a two dollar capacitor because if you're not buying like a hundred th uh, a thousand units bulk and even then a thousand units bulk you're paying a dollar a capacitor which is just ridiculous so like okay and th the problem is i have other like really high-end panasonic capacitors and i just don't use them on anything because it's just like but they're so expensive i don't want to put them on cards um even though i've actually tested those to have more impact in terms of overclocking than some of the other capacitors i have like they work really well it's just that they cost so damn much anyway 
So yeah, I piled on a whole bunch of multi-layer ceramics over here, which uh, the, the wire extensions are not ideal. But the thing about the multi-layer ceramics, me using the multi-layer ceramics here is that they are very low profile, right? So they clear the backplate properly. Whereas if I went with something larger, that wouldn't clear the backplate. I want to keep the backplate, right? VaporX card, I want to keep the cooling strip up here and all of that. So yeah, other than that, I added some extra capacitors to the uh, output, like th this end of the output of the VRM, because again, I'm just going like, well, Sapphire decided that this is the best place for their multi-layer ceramics. I can't realistically put any more there. So I'm just going to put mine as close to that as possible, right? So over here, and those are some 22s and a, and a, and a 47. So yeah, just a nice mishmash of, of capacitance all over the card. This is actually more uh, V-Core over here. So they have these like bulk V-Core, like relatively bulky V-Core capacitors crammed up against the core, which uh, this kind of reminds me of like, you know, how some of the extreme overclocking cards have like the uh, big fat neck token uh, prodlizers. Um, so yeah, like I'm not sure how much impact they have, but I, as a fan of applying capacitors in places they don't belong, I'm a fan of these, right? I've not seen that on any other 290X. Um, and then other than that, I've hit basically every single memory chip as well with some uh, extra capacitance. That, unfortunately, well, I'm not sure. If it has any impact, it's like a couple megahertz because, uh, like, after several rounds of cap mods, instead of, I think when I had the card bone stock, I was benching 1675. And I'm not sure if that's because I decided not to try 1685 or if 1685 was crashing, but eventually I was running 1685 with, uh, with the card in this condition, so... Yeah, um, cap mods everywhere. And then we have uh, these right here. So these are 1200 microfarad um, FP series uh, RS8 Nichicons. Um, or wait, FP, uh, FP RS8 series Nichicons. So 1200 microfarads because extra bulk right here. So very, lots of bulk, right? <laughs> 1200 microfarads is a, like, that's actually kind of the big, largest capacitor you can get in this package size. And these are like a low ESL variant as well. Um, which is why I like these over, say, some of the other capacitors I have in my collection. And then um, we actually have some... Uh, and these are actually the really expensive Panasonics right here. These right here. So these are 3 milliohm ESR 470 microfarad Panasonics, and I've just stacked them right on top of the, what, what was already on the card. These work great, except the when I tested these as working really well, I think I was using, like, five times as many of them. Which, uh, yeah, there's not that many of them here, but uh, I don't know. Like, it might actually be helping the card a little bit. The, the thing is, is uh, as I kept adding capacitors, the scores did get more consistent. They just didn't necessarily get a whole lot, like, better. Like, yeah, that, that's the thing. At, like, 1270, the card scores as good as it used to score at, like, I, I well, yeah, that's the thing. It rolls off, so it doesn't crash, but... Um, I, I think, like, they, these seem to, seem to have helped a little bit. Like, maybe 5 millivolts or something. I wouldn't say made the, they, they made a drastic difference. Not enough of a difference to make it worth doing all of this, but, uh, yeah. Well, still. <laughs> um, it, it did get a really, really high... Like, let's, let's just take a look at the Fire Strike score that I managed to squeeze out of it. So, here's the actual score. So, that's just the card alone. Great lucky number right there, right? <laughs> Um, and yeah, and th this is just the setup I was running. So obviously I don't have a full cover water block for this card, even though they, I do think EK made some full cover blocks for the card, but, uh, ultimately I just like using a core only block because far more convenient than a full cover block, right? And much cheaper. So yeah, um, that's what I cooled it with and... Score was good, ran, uh, 1271 with 1685 memory. And I am sixth for uh, R9290X. So it was, uh, it was not bad considering like the, the record for the 290X currently is on like dry ice, which uh, I do have plans of taking this card cold because the thing is about the 290X is you see everybody bench lightnings, you see them bench the Matrix. Nobody benches freaking Vapor X cards. And I, as a huge Sapphire fanboy, find that really unacceptable. There is, however, a one good reason why you wouldn't bench a Vapor X on LN2 and you would bench a Lightning or a Matrix or any of the other cards. And that reason is, uh, I think, this voltage regulator down here. 
Um, I think this one right here is the 0.95 volts rail. That's normally where the 0.95 volts rail is located on uh, 290Xs. And uh, the problem with this is, is you need to actually raise the voltage on this rail in order to get 290Xs to not to work at really low temperatures properly. Um, and well, simply put, um, I can't find a, well, I can't even identify the chip that's over there. So <laughs> that's, it's a pretty major issue. Yeah, I have no idea what that chip is. So without a voltage mod for this rail, this thing is not good for, you know, really cold benchmarking because it'll, it'll just not run properly, which, uh, yeah, that like, whereas if you have a matrix, um, that actually, like, that's the huge biggest advantage which, with the 290X Matrix is it has software voltage control for this rail. So it's literally, like, you can control it with software, which is super convenient. And then the Lightning, I think, actually also needs a Volt mod, and this needs a Volt mod. So, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one other thing that I need to do. Also, this doesn't have, like, voltage control for the memory, which uh, I'm not sure if I'll bother with the memory voltage mod because... The, the funny thing is with 290Xs, it's been ages since I last benched them, so I didn't actually remember that this was a thing, but the cards seem to scale, like, memory clock seems to scale with core voltage, which is, like, interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, I need to test that some more before I say for sure that that's the case, but uh, this card seems to do it, because if I try to apply 1685 at, like, stock voltage stock clocks, it just crashes as soon as you try to apply it. Um... So, yeah, I'm definitely not done with this card. It's just that I decided to do a video with it at this point because uh, um, I am planning to just kind of reassemble it, you know, have it on the stock air cooler. Maybe, maybe benchmark it a little bit on the stock air cooler just to get an idea of how good the air cooler is um, and then, then put it away in the box for a while and uh, work on other things because, uh, yeah, and then come back to it because like, that's the thing I love about extreme overclocking is just like, you know, being first with a 290X and uh, for like getting first place for 290X benchmarks or whatever, some eventually AMD is going to put out a driver that's going to make everybody beat you. And then you have an excuse to rebench the card that's been sitting in a box for several months, right? So, um, which I don't currently have the first place. It's just that I don't really want to rush into taking this sub zero anytime soon because uh, I do like this card far too much, and I think I'll take, like, the 290X Matrix Sub-Zero soon, because that obviously needs far less work than this does, and then, because I need to actually do the vault molds on this, and depending on how the 290X Matrix session goes, I'll take this cold, and, um, like, after that, I'll take this cold, and I think I might, like, I'm kind of considering running, like, Crossfire Dry Ice, um, with a cold CPU, maybe? I'm not entirely sure. Well, actually, I think I need a cold CPU, because 290X is, like, because the benchmarks I want to run is, like, Vantage, which I can do on, actually, I can do Vantage on water cooling with X299. So, yeah, I don't need Sub-Zero for Vantage. I just need Vantage to stop crashing on, uh, on startup. But, uh, the other benchmark I want to do is Unigen Heaven. Unigen Heaven is a benchmark I absolutely freaking love, because it's one of those benchmarks which, uh, well, for a long time, it wasn't about your CPU, and now it very much is. Like, at this point, GPUs and even 290Xs are just so damn fast that if you have two 290Xs on Sub-Zero cooling, you need to run, like, a 6-plus gigahertz CPU. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> still, or at least I think uh, when the record for the 290X uh, Crossfire setup uh, for Unigen was set, it was, like, on a 6-plus gigahertz 4770K. So if I want to beat that record, I'm probably going to need the 9900K at like 6 gigahertz or something, which, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, unfortunately not a very convenient card to run on dry ice, I guess. So I guess I might just take it on liquid nitrogen and go for it in, in Crossfire. Um, and the thing with, like, the thing about liquid nitrogen is that if you are running it, like, the, the it's, con like, you can hold whatever temperature you feel like. You can hold 60, you can hold 50, hell, you can hold minus 20. You can hold minus 20 degrees Celsius on liquid nitrogen if you're, if you're good enough at pouring. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, this, this is, I think, like, the height of Sapphire's uh, VaporX series. Like, I'm, I'm, I think it's quite a shame that they didn't do a Toxic Edition card. They did do a VaporX 6 gig, but they didn't brand it as a Toxic, which uh, doesn't really make that much of a difference, right? <laughs> but, like, the 7970 Toxic was a 6 gig with, like, a stupid high boost clock. They didn't do the same thing with the 290Xs. They just kind of did 290X VaporX 3 gig and 290X VaporX 6 gig and... 
yeah. Um, anyway, still just an absolute, like, the thing is, with this card, they really took the Vaporex Quilling just to, I think, its limit, right? Like, this is a, I think, the only 3-fan Vaporex Heatsink. Um, and the 290X, of course, is the hottest uh, card that has gotten the Vaporex treatment. Um, so, yeah, 3-fan Heatsink. You have the, the Quilling Strip up here, which I think is really cool. You have one of my favorite VRM designs from Sapphire. Um, though they, there's also the Sapphire, like, uh, RX Vega 64 limited edition Nitro, and that thing has a 14 phase for V-Core, which I, like, I want that one as well, <laughs> but, um, and then the triple eight pins, but it doesn't have things like the, the cooling stripe, it doesn't have, well, that one has the usual Vega L-shape VRM layout, so, I mean, you can't really complain about that too much, can you, because that, that's also a pretty sp special VRM layout, but, uh, still... This is a freaking, like, as far as the, the Nitro cards go, this is definitely, like, the the peak of the Nitros. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, I hope we see some, uh, like, Toxic, is, uh, I mean, Sapphire is supposedly uh, reviving the Toxic branding with, uh, with Navi. So, hopefully, we might see something as impressive as this. Um, in terms of the PCB, because, like, the thing is, yes, they do really great heat sinks, and that's the part most people focus on, but Sapphire also comes out with some pretty, uh, pretty interesting PCBs and pretty unique PCBs, and I think it's just a shame that, well, I, I wish they were more into extreme overclocking, but they're really very much like a gaming-dedicated company, like, they have zero interest in extreme overclocking, as, as far as I know, so, um, yeah, that's a bit of a shame, but, uh, Still, I, I'm a huge Sapphire fan, so that's like it. Look, if the card doesn't support extreme overclocking, I'm gonna make it support extreme overclocking. I, I'm I'm eventually gonna figure out how to get this to run voltages that I desire, not necessarily what it's set to. So, yeah. Anyway, that is it for the video. Um, hopefully, this wasn't too boring because it is just me talking about a card, <laughs> right? And how how um, well fanboying on a card really, but. Uh, yeah, hopefully this wasn't too boring. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave. I mean, like if it wasn't boring, right? But <laughs> I think that that goes without saying. Anyway, so uh, wh where was I going? Right, I have a... If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, um, I mean, I have a Patreon. I have... Uh, there's Teespring. You can buy merch on Teespring like shirts um, and socks and posters and stickers. And if you don't want to buy anything, there is the Patreon. It gives you early access to some AHOC videos, and it also gives you, um, access to some, like, bonus videos, which are basically, but AHOC bonus videos are videos I deem so low quality or just not worth, uh, releasing to the general public for one reason or another. So they just get stuck on, on the AHOC Discord, and, you know, you get access to the AHOC Discord through, through Patreon. So, yeah, um, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.